And welcome to the podcast at the intersection of faith and fear, where every week we discuss what scares us in order to find what saves us. This is the Fear of God podcast. Speaking to you right now is one of your hosts, Nathan Rouse, and typically with me is fellow co-host, Reed Lackey. And guys, he was here a minute ago, but he was heading confidently and Frenchly out the door to a rehearsal. Um, But before he left, he said if he was only casting the white swan, that it would be mine. So I can't wait for that cast list to go up. In the meantime, allow me to welcome you back to our year-long umbrella series, that of 2020-2020, where we examine 20 films of the last 20 years in the year 2020, a year that feels like 20 in itself. Last week, we discussed Drag Me to Hell, aka America in 2020. Just kidding. That was 2009. This week, covering 2010, is the Darren Aronofsky film, Black Swan. But I'm getting ahead of myself because here at The Fear of God, we explore. We don't explain, except for right now, when I explain that you can listen to The Fear of God at your nearest podcast platform. You can watch The Fear of God on YouTube, and you can browse The Fear of God on the web at thefearofgodpodcast.com, where you'll find episode archives and merch, including cell phone cases, t-shirts, campaign buttons, face masks. You better wear them. They're meant for others, not for you, okay? Magnets, pillows, read! Hey, buddy. Read, um, hey, read. Okay, you are sleeping. That is unexpected. Hi. Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, your your performance there just uh, it lulled me into a sweet sense of oh. restfulness, and uh, and so well, yeah. So okay, that? well, I don't know how to receive that, but but if I can ask, Reed, did um, I, am I your Snow Queen? Well, I'll tell you, Nathan, you are, but you do have an alternate. What? Yeah. An an alternate? What? But who? Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Find a job. Let's see. Business section. Ooh la la! What do we got here? Let me... <laughs> see how see how long I can hold that. Wide eyes. Oh, I can handle that guy as an alternate. It's all good. <laughs> I mean, let him have the stage. I mean, I've got sure. the He's got more than I do. Nice. Sure. That's right. It is time for the Fear of God call to action segment. Yes, it is. Um, once more. Uh, and for the foreseeable future, we want your email so that you can get a Fear of God sticker designed mm-hmm. by Jacob Hunt, mailed directly to your post office box, as long as we hopefully still have a post office. Hey, keep the post office funded. Um, But- Is is everything dire these days? uh, A little bit, yeah, actually. Um, So go to the website where it says subscribe, put your email in there and hit enter. We'll be checking that. Uh, Once you're in, we're gonna send you a request for your mailing address, at which time you will then be sent a sticker. We've already sent out a good crop of them. Um, once you have your sticker, you can put it on your, your water bottle. You can put it on your computer. You can put it wherever you want, take a picture of it, post it to social media. And what happens if they post it, Read. So if you post it to social media and if you tag us, and it, it doesn't just have to be the sticker. I mean, anything that you post relative to the show, you can share the show itself. You can share your favorite episode. You can share a review. You can just comment about the show if you want to or share that newly acquired sticker that you receive. But if you share that to social media and you tag us in it, you are automatically going to be entered in for the chance to win an autographed copy of Lovecraft Country autographed by the author Matt Ruff because next week we are going to be starting our book club. 
So uh, next week we have a conversation with author Matt Ruff. And so that means you only have two weeks uh, this week and next week to share something to social media, tag the show. You will automatically be entered uh, for a chance to win an autographed copy of Lovecraft Country. Uh, that's very exciting. I'm very, very excited about that. That is very exciting. And so, the other yeah. call to action, read that have been coming in already, but we want some more, you know, um, is the I audience. Want it all. <laughs> you want it when? Now. <laughs> <laughs> that, yes. no! um, we, we, wow. I'm glad, I'm glad to see you, buddy. Um, we want you guys, we want you guys to record, as a la read just then, um, record your own version. It can be a rock opera version, you know, a big hair version. That's I all. would love to hear a big That'd hair rock opera. Um, oh record gosh, your yeah. variation of the what you're watching, what you're reading, what you're listening to uh, theme song. And we're going to be using these. We've already begun using yes. these. We're going to continue using these. We want to create a database of listeners' renditions of what you're watching, reading, listening to and play mm -hmm. it on the show when we watch, read, and listen to things. Um, it doesn't have to be you. It can be you, it can be your family, it can be your kids, your coworkers on your next Zoom meeting, what, whoever. Yeah. Use your voice memo recorder or something equally easy and email it to fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com. We'll use it on the show and we will credit to you. Reed, do you have any other calls to action you would like to issue forth to the listeners? Uh, I think I'm good. If they will do those three things, they will make my heart very happy and I would appreciate it very much. So yes, that. Well, in the spirit of that, I'm going to send my alternate away. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. It's showtime. Nicely done. Lackey. Lackey the Listicle. <laughs> oh. Speaking of characters, welcome back, Lackey the Listicle. <laughs> it's so good to have you. I he miss Lackey back. the Listicle. And I'm in I'm in a, a, a new location. I'm in you a are different in a new location. I'm, I'm in a different I'm in a different space. So I don't know if listeners could tell, but uh well listeners can't tell. Viewers yeah. on YouTube viewers might be able to tell. Yeah, yeah viewers well, they might be able to. Be able to. That, uh, that I am actually, I'm, I'm in a, a special place. I am in the home of my in beloved wife. In the small wife's. world? Oh, okay. Yes. I'm in the home of my beloved wife's beloved parents. And, uh, There's I'm a lot very, of belovedness very, there. There is. There is. Like it's, it. it's true. Um, so we had the opportunity, uh, much needed and, and uh, well, yeah, desperately needed and uh, much adored uh, opportunity to spend some time with them. We had done our necessary quarantine restrictions and regulations and been spending some time with them. And it's, uh, yeah, it's been really, it's been really nice. It's been really refreshing. And they have a room completely dedicated to Disneyland. So, um, so yeah, Lackey That's the Listicle, wonderful. it is, it is. So Lackey the Listicle is, uh, out of, Lackey the Listicle is in a new location. And, uh, so now as we have been doing, uh, all this year, we are tagging in on your favorite horror films from 2000 all the way up through 2020. It is 2020. 2020. So we are right <laughs> now going to, you. you are <laughs> such a good co-host. You went ahead and and notated the the I far did. cannon. Yeah, I so, did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. yeah, you, you, <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. So we are going to count down your listener voted top ten favorite horror films of 2010. Um, we're going to do that right now for you. Uh, before we get into our fuller, broader conversation, uh, do you want to take odds or evens on this? I'm going to take want? odds. You're going to take odds. Okay, yep. so that means I'm going to dive in with number 10. And so this is uh, a film that was a shortlist contender. We never actually covered it, but it is a really strong film. It was a shortlist contender for our series called Speaking in Tongues, uh, where we covered a bunch of foreign language horror films. We will probably, if we revive that series again at some time in the future, uh, maybe we will get across to this one. It is directed by Andre Ovredal. It is Troll Hunter. Have you ever seen this? I have not. I just it's, wanted to hear you take a crack at the name. Oh, that's why okay. I gave you the. I don't know that I got it right. I know, but, but I, I gave it a good shot. You did. You gave it the old college try. I did. I gave it a grad student try. I don't know about that. <laughs> don't get ahead of yourself. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. This is a this is a really fun film. Uh, just basically the premise. It's it's kind of a faux documentary style where they're hunting trolls and monsters, and for what I presume is a rather limited budget have some really impressive effects like when they are driving or when they confront 
the actual monstrous trolls it looks it looks pretty great um oh, is it like earnest level trolls no 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 it's the, like some of you could look up the poster and don't, you, you'll see it's like don't diss the earnest trolls no i'm not dissing the earnest trolls I'm like saying, the earnest trolls are proximate height to a average human being these trolls are gigantic oh they're, they are huge and so they're they're more like colossus you know and so they are uh just incredible like there's the the poster art if you just pull up troll hunter the poster art will show you like there's a car and in the distance you can see like the legs like the troll you know extends out of frame like the it only goes up to about waist high for them so it's yeah it's it, it's a really interesting and fun and the second play. one was like the world tour that was the follow troll up. hunter troll hunter world tour that is yeah. it yes cool okay i, I haven't Good seen that times. one yet either <laughs> yeah exactly so um and this is the hey, Reed, you know, I was just looking at show. i haven't had a haircut in like four months it is just it's wild why do you think i thought proactively and always have my hat on well i can't wear hats my head's too big 40 yeah. years of that no really <laughs> <laughs> you're like no no, no 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 i'm not just like pandering for a gag here no, no. it's a thing okay. okay i'm sorry i'm sorry regardless so, moving uh, right along yeah moving uh, right along number nine is uh directed by gareth edwards the film monsters i love this movie it's a great film yeah fantastic. it's a really great film. i would love to cover this again if only yeah. to be able to see it again yes no it's it's a really really great film uh very subversive kind of uh not in an antagonistic way just in a in a thought-provoking and, and unique way uh kind of idea of of, of not only monsters and their uh, sort of the alien invasion but also some hints of like a you know a, a pandemic sort of uh like viral spread sort of thing it's been years since i've seen it but i remember really really liking it quite a bit so yeah we should we should uh Put this on the old radar to get some get some coverage. I would love to watch that. it again. So, um, speaking of coverage, the next one is one we have covered. This uh, number eight, directed by Matt Reeves. Speaking of Batman, yes, exactly. Um, Fear of God episode twenty two. It was the Dracula companion, the companion to the Universal Monsters film Dracula. It is Let Me In, the remake, the American remake of uh, the Swedish film, Let the Right One In, uh, which I infamously cite that I enjoy Let Me In more than the Swedish original. Though I do respect greatly and greatly enjoy the Swedish original. But you can listen to all of our thoughts on that one. That is still an episode. I don't know if you know this, but that is still an episode that I, um, in my mind, go back to from time to time. I really... I'm proud of that episode. I'm proud of our conversation about it. Uh, it's been, obviously we're three years into this and nearly 200 episodes, so it's it was a long time ago. But I really enjoy uh, the conversation that we had out of that. So uh, so yeah, I'm very proud of that. The listeners should go check it out. It's a good one. It's a good number one. seven. Speaking of material we have covered long ago, is <laughs> the film Devil, directed by John Eric Dowdle. That would be. Fear of God, episode number two. Number two, I can't believe it. That's crazy. That's it was, it was our. Uh, We've been of... doing this a while, like you know, it's, uh, you know, three years. Is a, that's a lot of horror to consume. It's true. I'm white-headed. Um, but it's, it's funny that that film holds a special place in my heart and always will. And and I. Uh, championed for it to be our inaugural film to cover. Obviously, our pilot episode was just a conversation, sort of introducing people to the concept. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I was glad to see Devil get some love this time around. Fear of God episode two. It's hard to believe how far we have come. That is crazy to think about. Um, okay, so number kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Number six, directed by Breck Eisner, uh, remade from a film, a lesser known film by Night of the Living Dead director George Romero. It is The Crazies, starring Timothy Oliphant. This is a film I have for a very, very long time been meaning to get to and, because I hear that it's great. I hear actually uh, that it is better than the original by George Romero, uh, that it's stronger, and I've been meaning to make it to it and just never got around to it. Well, we should uh, do that together. We should, yeah, maybe, just... we, maybe we just like launch in. You know what? Let's scrap what we did 
for this week. Let's just let's pause real quick. We'll go watch the crazies and then we'll. I mean, I'm just and, you just got to look at the headlines if you want to watch the crazies. I mean, that's a sad but fair point. Um, but no, I I'm assuming you haven't seen it. This is true. <laughs> so, but I but no, I hear it's I hear it's fantastic. I hear it's really really strong, and I would love to see it. I would well, love to comment more. We about should one figure second. out a way to work it in, Riri. We should. Um, speaking of things I've also not seen is number five. I saw the devil. This is a film. I uh, yeah. Why don't you? Who directed that? <laughs> <laughs> who directed, that uh, directed by Ji Woon Kim. That was not too bad. Okay. It's great. I, but but I did intentionally make a note to not say it. That was yeah, funny. of course, of course. That's funny. Um, that is a film I have seen, and man, that is that is one of the, it's a South Korean film, and that is one of those that just. It's one of those undeniably powerful experiences that you're just not sure you want to go through again because it's hmm. it's it's oppressive I would based on that title. Well, and yeah, I mean the 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 fundamental premise is like a um, a police detective who is hunting a serial killer, and instead of what's wild about this story is that he catches him pretty early in the film tortures him and then lets him go only to do it all again like the police chief because this sadistic serial killer tortures and kills his victims in violent oppressive ways the police chief is not satisfied with simply having apprehended him he then torments the guy and cuts him loose to hunt him again and that's wow. and it's 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 a fascinating and undeniably powerful film but good lord it is a difficult viewing experience. Um, it's again, it's very thought provoking, really powerful, but it is, it is challenging uh, to sit through. Um, but it is your number five listeners. Uh, I understand why it's here, even though it's something that I would not be necessarily eager to queue up again. I understand why it's this high on the list. Cause once you've seen it, like it's, it's, it's really affecting it. It sticks with you. Um, number four, uh, film. I don't know if this is the only time he's been on this list, or I, I feel like this is the only time he's yeah. he's crossed over in here. But directed by the one and only Martin Scorsese, uh, it this is one that is soon to be a Fear of God episode because uh, spoiler tease. It is featured in Phase Two of our hashtag In the Morning series uh, when we cover Season Two of The Leftovers. But it's Shutter Island. Um, and have you ever seen, will, when we cover it on the leftovers, will that be your first time seeing it or have you seen it nope. before? I saw it in the theaters. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I love it. I was delighted to see it this high in the list. Cause I think it's, I think it's a really strong film. Um, I had actually read the novel. I believe the novel was by Dennis Lehane. I had read the novel before I saw the adaptation was really taken with the novel was really taken with the adaptation. And so, yeah, when I saw it land at number four, I was just, I was I was so happy. I was delighted. An elated lackey. I was an elated lackey. <laughs> a, elated lackey, the listicle in a new location. So um <laughs> I <laughs> but uh but yes, yeah, so so we'll we'll sort of pause our thoughts on that other than my uh obvious affection because again, in just a few weeks, I'm not sure exactly where it'll fall in the schedule, but it will be part of season two of the leftovers and, and phase two of hashtag in the morning. So yep, Shutter Island by Martin Scorsese. Uh, number three on the list is uh, Fear of God episode number 90 in the middle of our Blumhouse series, that of yes. Insidious, directed by James Wan, right? Yes, uh, James you Wan. You left yes. it off the list. I just did I'm, that from memory. <laughs> I'm glad Been you Been doing did, this a while. I'm, I meant to include it. And, it's and all right. I, You're just I testing forgot. me. I, I was, sort of appreciate I was, it. You know, like you get to skip out on the bad names. So I'm going to see, I'm just going to see what you do with yeah, no name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and see if you can just conjure it. <laughs> Um, speaking of James Wan, so, um, a different, different movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah. So listen to all of our thoughts on episode 90 of the fear of God to hear how we felt about insidious. It is your number three. Number two is directed by Eli Craig fear of God episode 137, part of our hashtag funny or die series. It is Tucker and Dale versus that's a Eli. great episode and great movie. It is. It's such a fun movie. It's it's an episode I'm really proud of, and it's a lot of fun to listen to. That whole series was a blast because you know before we suddenly lacking. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and you know, remember the days when we could talk about horror material and we could crack jokes and we could laugh and have a really great time. Remember that? That's I still do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we tried. You're the sad sack around here. <laughs> Whoa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, number one, yeah. Riri. Number one on the Fear of God listener voted best of 2010 and our featured film for today is the Natalie Portman Mila? Mila. I think it's Mila. I think it's Mila. Mila no, I Kunis. think it's Mila. The reason well, I'm you know so what? confident. Tomato, that, tomato, read. Yeah, but yeah. But the, okay. no, 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 no. Wait. The the reason, <laughs> okay. Uh, the reason that I am so confident is Mila is because I know that you just she, have that. No, 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 no. Um, I know that uh, she is really good friends with. Um, oh shoot! And now I am blanking hmm. on his name. Well, uh, the they went uh, back. who's the family guy? guy uh why am i blanking on his name the family guy seth mcfarlane seth mcfarlane or seth, seth mcfarlane is that Sorry. oh yeah um seth mcfarlane featured in his film like a million ways to die in the west mm. i know they're really good friends and he said mila kunis in that in that film so I'm well sure i regret mila. attempting it now so yeah, after that so black swan is number one <laughs> <laughs> directed by darren aronofsky so after all of that yeah. black swan is i also film. forgot that Winona Riddare is in this <laughs> film. So, <laughs> Winona. Good old Winona. <laughs> Winona. So that has been the top Woo. 10 of 2010. Riri, do you want to get, offer some commentary while I... Uh... Yeah, go ahead and pull up the top five grossing box office films of 2010. Um, so, oh, wow. um, so what's interesting is... I'm seeing there's there's a lot of films that play with sort of um, mistaken reality or sort of heightened reality. Shutter Island certainly has that. Uh, Insidious sort of bleeds into that idea of the, you know, into the further, uh, the, the sort of world beyond the world. Um, Tucker and Dale versus Evil plays around with the ideas of, of differing it's perspectives. It's a doozy of a day. It's a doozy of a day. Um, so what's interesting is I'm just, I'm seeing... Uh, there's a lot of films in here that play around with people's perceptions of, of reality versus what actually is reality. Tucker and Dale versus Evil plays with that. Black Swan plays with that. Insidious plays with that. Shutter Island plays with that. I Saw the Devil could be argued because of these different, uh, it, it doesn't play around with sort of false realities. Um, devil, you have characters on an elevator. One of them is the devil himself. You don't know who it is. So it's interesting. There seems to be uh, a, a theme in some of these films of what is real and what is not, and there being a reality beyond reality that listen that uh, characters within the stories have to come to terms with and have to come to grips with. Um, and I do find that fascinating. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm taking away from well, this. Thank list. you for those observations, Reed. Um, interestingly, so Nathan. as always, I do a little quick scan. I'm sorry. I, I said Nathan. <laughs> uh, number twenty-two, uh, top box office earners worldwide in 2010 is Shutter Island by Martin Scorsese. Well, really? And, oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And number 16 is Black Swan by Darren. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, but looking at Good the fit. six through 10, uh, cause I just like to do that cause it's fun. But uh, Tangled is on there, which is a great flick. That's a um, wonderful flick. Iron Man 2, which is an okay flick. And How That's to Train okay. a Dragon is number 10. But the- The first How You Train a Dragon? Uh -huh. oh, um, yeah, that's a really good movie. One through five, from five to one. Number five is Shrek Forever After, you know? Okay. Okay, yep. I mean, I like the Shrek movies. They're fine. They're fun, but that's whatever. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've, I've grown to not have much affection for them over the years. Really? Um, that's interesting. I mean, one, I've got fun memories around, but that's about it. Um, number four is uh, Christopher Nolan's Inception. Mr. That's Nolan. not surprising. Um, sure. 2010, 10 years later, will Tenet release to theaters? Who knows? Uh, we shall see. Number three on the list is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. Part 1? Oh, nice. At $976.5 million. It's number three? That's where we are? Mm -hmm. All right. Number two. Number two. Making $50 million more than Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows bizarrely is alice in wonderland the burton the tim burton one yeah 
that shocks me. It does. Because I mean, I, I don't. I never saw it. I never saw it. Well, but it also like, I mean, we're not going to unpack this obviously because it 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 made the numbers it made. But I'm just like, nobody talks about that movie. Like, I mean, people who saw it seem to I just bet like Tim Burton does. Maybe. Not as much as he talks about Beetlejuice. Um, I'm just kidding. I don't know how much he talks about any of right. his films. But, so number um, one, <laughs> yeah, 2010, that actually only, goodness gracious, only beat Alice in Wonderland by 40 million is Toy Story 3. Now that is a worthy yes, it is film. But isn't that That's remarkable? It. Like number one was 1.06. Number two was 1.02. That's crazy. That's billion. just... Alice in Wonderland made a billion dollars. That's a that's lot just, of money for what feels like a pretty random entry. It's just so it's just so completely wild to me. I just because because of the film it is. It's like it didn't even it wasn't even that revolutionary of a production or anything. Like there's no special gimmick to it technologically speaking. Uh, like Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, it's not as if Alice in Wonderland was this revelatory thing for even for Burton in his catalog. It's just it's just a, a such an odd entry to be at number two, but. It, it made what it made. Although Fine. you could argue maybe it's the, the wave created by pirates because Depp is in Alice in Wonderland. Like did that. Oh, okay. Kind of okay. Buoy it up. Buoy. Maybe, maybe. May buoy. Marbury. <laughs> oh, so that's that not has, what we're here to talk about today. No, no, it's not. That has been yet another installment of hashtag 2020, 2020, your top favorite horror films of 2010 and topping the list for you which is interesting because as we've seen with a couple of these recent lists 2010 as votes began to come in from listeners the number one slot kind of shifted around between tucker and dale insidious and black swan and it kind of uh just depending on when we checked for how many votes had come in uh i think for a while insidious topped the list but then tucker and dale was up near the top for a while um literally the day we closed voting we had just received like two new votes in uh like the night before i closed it and they put black swan up to the top into the number one spot so this was uh your favorite horror film of 2010 aronofsky had mentioned before that he and this is our this is our second film of his covering on the show we covered mother uh forget the episode number but quite some time ago and um I I can remember when I saw this film, uh, my wife and I actually saw it together. I think we went to the theaters to see it. And she was mostly watching it because she's a, a, a very big Natalie Portman fan. Um, and Natalie Portman is, is understandably a very interesting actor. She does a lot of, uh, she's got a wide variety to her catalog. But Aronofsky makes some really heavy and hard to stomach films. Um, and I read in my little trivial bit sort of taking that he, he never marketed it as such, but always considered this to be sort of a psychological horror film. I don't know how you could watch this film and think it was anything other than that. And I, I forget the marketing around it. I don't know if they were marketing, marketing it as like a, a gritty surrealist drama or, or something. But um, I, Yeah, I referred to it as the psychological body horror ballet film. Ah, okay. You know, and that is not suspicious. Nice little mashup. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Well, yeah. Yes. Correct. Yes. Hey, funny. This isn't a trivial bit. It's just a funny story about Black Swan that I want to tell before I yes. forget it. Yeah. Go right ahead. So, what you might not recall is this film came out Christmas Day of 2010. Did it? Yeah. Good and Lord. the reason I know that is because for a number of years prior to all the kids, um, just all of them, there's so many, um, <laughs> all the children, I would coerce my wife into going to see as a kind of tradition going to the movie theater on christmas day hmm. um you know just have uh that as a little tradition we had um, sure and we were in georgia visiting her uh parents and went to see just scooted out and went to see black swan and the, and it's like you know afternoon christmas day and it gets to the end that just lands with a, just just a goodness gracious the, how this movie sort of ends itself and i remember just getting up and just going merry christmas <laughs> 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 it's just because it was just so 
heavy by the end of it. It's, it's like, all right, oh my this God. is how all of us chose to spend part of our Christmas oh day. God, no kidding. Anyway, oh, so yeah. on with your bits, Reed. No, it's a, it's quite true. Aronofsky, boy, he, he knows how to bring you down if he, uh, I mean, he just. Now, <laughs> would you argue that the fount, it's, I've only seen it once, but I remember having a lot of affection in a positive way for the fountain. No, oh, I, uh, yeah, uh, no. The, the not that my affection film. for Black Swan isn't positive, but you know, like Black Swan, I respect as a film, but it's dour as hell. Uh, the Fountain, I feel like I remember having, like, wow, being stirred by it. It's got a more optimistic lilt to it um, for a number of reasons. It's brighter than mm -hmm. a lot of his films, just color palette and production wise. Um, but also the, the theme of it is definitely more in the spirit of rejuvenation and, and, and sort of brightness. Um, my favorite film of his, though I would make a, and I'm about to, I'm a, I think there's a case to be made Do it. that Black Swan might be his strongest film in terms of craft. But my favorite film of his is actually The Wrestler. Um, I, I, I did not the see The Wrestler. Yeah, I love The Wrestler. I haven't seen The Wrestler, and I haven't seen Requiem for a Dream. So Requiem for a Dream, uh, he made the film Pie. Uh, I didn't see that. It's, I like uh, to eat that. Yes. Um, pretty sure he made the film Pie. Yes, he made the that film Pie. Right. Um, and uh, he, yeah, I think, I think that might be it. Pie, Requiem for a Dream, The Wrestler, uh, Black Swan, Mother, Noah. He made Noah. Mm, yeah. Um, and and Noah was I mean Noah was was okay I don't I don't think Noah deserved the derision it received but at the same time I didn't think it was I didn't find it a worthy enough film for me to like champion the reverse sure. like I, you know it was I defended it a bit from some of the overwhelming onslaught of like this is blasphemous Floods, and evil and wrong like yeah a flood of just negative yes absolutely the negative deluge voices. of negativity. Yeah. <laughs> um, just just got saturated with just like i mean yeah you just yeah. had to ring it out yeah i was drowning in comments of just like <laughs> just, just left and right <laughs> it's just uh i felt Ugh. like you know i just felt like he started making a film and it was just leaking everywhere and so yeah it was just, it yeah was, it yeah was, it was a problem it's like um, these, these these negative comments were coming too bad too <laughs> And I mean, like, eventually they just couldn't hold water. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was just, it's too much. Goodness gracious. Oh, so anyway, okay. So off of the aquatic puns, um, I, I find Aronofsky to be a really strong and interesting filmmaker. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Wrestler, like so many of his films, is, is heavy. Um, it, it's a little bit difficult to watch, but um, res Wrestler has an emotionality to it that I find really strong. And it, it kind of represented for a lot of people the return of Mickey Rourke, because Mickey Rourke back in the 80s was sort of this up and coming, uh, potentially legendary actor, very famous, um, and had kind of disappeared for a while, had had some personal troubles, uh, had been in some things, but was not really on the scene. And the wrestler championed his return. Aronofsky frequently has performers who deliver like award-worthy um, performances. I know Requiem for a Dream had some nominations. I think Ellen Burstyn won, if I'm, if I'm not uh, forgetting. Mickey Rourke, I believe, won the Oscar for The Wrestler. Uh, Natalie Portman won for this film. She actually, this is one of my trivial bits, uh, the, fil the film Black Swan received multiple award nominations, but Natalie Portman herself swept. So oh, wow. she won Every single category for which she was nominated Best Actress that award season, she won Best Actress that award mm -hmm. season. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it, by the end of this film, it makes perfect sense why she swept. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. In other words, even at the halfway mark, you're like, okay, this is good. This is good. I'm sure she went through some rigorous physical whatever to do this. But the further it goes, the more she shows, the more wackadoo things get. You're like, okay, yeah. this is uh, killer performance. And she really, so I don't know why or exactly how it hit her radar beforehand, but so she's credited in a lot of ways with helping the project even get off the ground because of her enthusiasm and support for it. So she was attached to it before there was ever a completed script. She even self-funded her own dance instruction. So she took a year of professional dance training before the production ever received funding and she paid for it out of her own pocket. Um, and so she was Phantom Menace money, brother. 
<laughs> that's that Star Wars money just doesn't stop. <laughs> so, um, so basically, like she she's credited with letting you know with kind of helping the film get where it needed to get to the degree that even and I thought this story was fascinating. She really deeply believed in this, put a lot of herself into it because even on set when she sustained a concussion, I, I can't remember if it was because she sustained multiple injuries on this, on this production. Uh, I can't remember if this was her concussion or her dislocated rib, but they didn't have an onset medic and they couldn't afford one in the budget. So she commented and she said, take my trailer. I don't need a trailer. Take my trailer and pay for a medic to get somebody here. So the next day when she showed up to set, like trailer was gone, medic was there. That was it. So like she really um, was very invested. It sounds like financially and personally in making sure this well, film it paid off, it brother. It, at least in awards, it it sure enough did. Um, so that having been said, um, there was some brief controversy because Natalie Portman obviously had thrown herself into this role so holistically, but her body and dance double claimed after the fact that the producers had asked her not to do any press for the film so that Natalie Portman would get most of the credit. So basically what began to arise, this is fascinating for me to read, what began to arise was I guess there was someone who was on set to help with the more complicated dance steps, most mm -hmm. specifically close-ups of, of foot points and, mm -hmm. and things that would be a little bit more technically uh, demanding for Natalie Portman to pull off. But then that person began to publicize at some point that she really did most of the dancing and that um, Natalie Portman got all the credit for it. But Aronofsky, Mila Kunis, the choreographer, who it Ooh. should be noted, uh, Mila, <laughs> um, the choreographer, who it should be noted later became Natalie Portman's fiance, uh, but multiple people from the production came forward and refuted this, mostly not in defense of the production, but in defense of Portman, because they were like, look, Natalie Portman worked her butt off to get ready for this, and they went in, so, Aronofsky presumably went so far as to count individual shots. And he said, uh, he reported later, he's like, there are 139 dance shots in this film. And of them, 111 of them are unaltered Natalie Portman doing her work. So that's 80% mm -hmm. of the work. So it was, it was pretty squashed down that anybody who tried to like take credit away from what Portman brings to this film, he was like, nope, this is, she really deserves all of the praise that she's receiving for this. Um, I did find this interesting. Aronofsky apparently attempted to create a rivalry offset to help heighten the performances between uh, Mila Kunis. That's Mila, like me. I'm gonna call and, her. La. and then um, Lily. <laughs> Lily. Um, so between Mila Kunis and Natalie Portman, he tried to create this rivalry. And the way he did it was by trying to like sort of drop little comments about their performances from the day and be like, oh, that, yeah, like. Natalie Portman really blew it out of the park and, and he was trying to make comments to them that would generate this bit of tense rivalry, but because they were friends from before the production, all it resulted in them doing is going and say, Hey, I heard you killed it today. Like it, they would just champion and cheer each other on That's awesome. uh, and applaud each other, which I, which I thought was such a great story. Um, this was one of only six horror films in Oscar history to be nominated for best picture. The other five were the exorcist jaws, the Silence of the Lambs, The Sixth Sense, and Get Out. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, I did find this last little bit interesting. It's got obviously echoes and similarities to other body horror, most specifically The Fly, um, but it also has some similarities to a Japanese animated film called Perfect Blue, which I had heard about a lot and just saw for the first time last year when it became available through this library service Hoopla for me to be able to check out and rent. Um, and it, there's even an overhead shot in the bathroom of Natalie Portman that's almost directly mirrors a shot from Perfect Blue. What's interesting to me about this trivial bit is Aronofsky denied Perfect Blue being an influence on this film, despite the fact that that shot is identical and that he himself purchased the rights to remake Perfect Blue like years ago, before he ever even made Requiem for a Dream. But he insists that it had no influence on this Sounds film. Sounds like there's a lot of denials and stuff yeah and corrections little, and yeah. disinformation going on around the black swan production because more than that if you i don't i assume you caught this uh you are an eagle-eyed viewer i mean <clears throat> what we also learn 
is that Black Swan is uh, kind of MCU canon as well. Um, because I Sebastian did, did. Stan shows up um, as Andrew, right? Uh, but I mean, you know, if you know anything about anything, you'll know that this is more likely just the Winter Soldier got de-iced for a night. He was doing some recon work for Hydra because Toma had defected, right? So Toma, the dance instructor, dance instructor, uh, previously worked, you know, uh, under, you know, uh, the 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 heritage of Arnim Zola and the Red Skull. Sure. Um, yes. And you know they needed to rein him in, so the Winter Soldier was doing some recon work, checking out the dancers, trying to get close to the company. Because um, what we don't know is right after this movie. <laughs> Yeah, when it's so like you like thirty we'll minutes later, there. you're still yeah. <laughs> thirty minutes later, you're still and then, and then that's when he connected well, back up, and after that, and then. So this is before the Shield Hydra connection was revealed, you know, and it's like you just don't know. You just and don't know. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. You know, like um, what's her name? What's Natalie's character's name? It doesn't matter, but she. What the dance company itself was a front for a hydra cell. Um, you know, that's how they do, man. Just hail hydra. This is still going, and I'm imp- I'm impressed. Thank you. So uh, no, that's fun. That's fun to see him in there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that is the extent of uh my trivial bits. I want to know, uh, other than you know your experience Christmas Day, and just like. Merry Christmas. Um, what I mean, what do you think about this film? What are your general thoughts, feelings? Like, where does where does this film sit for you when you think about it or watch it? It sits rather painfully. Mm. Uh, no, I, I I like it. Um, I mean, it's not like a you know, it's not like a I fun know. fun hang, <laughs> but it's a great flick and it's a yeah, hell of a really performance. Is, yeah, and, it's a strong film. And I couldn't remember. Um, you know, jump to the end. I, I I didn't remember exactly how the finale played out, other oh, than that I okay. I mean I remembered her dying, but I didn't remember kind of the the you know the sequence of events that led to that. So you know what's you know what's interesting about that there Tell is, me. and I think Natalie Portman herself is of this camp. There's there's a eighty percent of the camp at least. Uh, yes, at least there's a train of thought, a theory that what you're witnessing at the end there is actually not her death in the in the real that you're you're witnessing a sort of like rite of passage if you were that what she instead what instead died was actually the thing holding her back from being her full potential that she was actually and and I didn't hear her express this in any sort of explicit way but Natalie Portman apparently went into the production thinking okay my character is going to die at the end but then ultimately at the end viewed it differently viewed it not as if her character physically perishing but as her character sort of moving on from that sort of wayfish inhibitions that she was constantly feeling under the restriction of which i thought was interesting um and i know that it's ambiguous on purpose Aronofsky has a tendency to do that with his with his endings. Um, and as in, you think it's ambiguous whether she actually expires or not? I do. I think it's ambiguous whether she dies or not, um, because we do see that she's wounded, and we see everybody around her making a big to do about the fact that she's wounded. But just that sort of fade to white um, that that uh, I, I think that leaves some room to wonder if that's really what happened or not. I think there's room to wonder. For me personally, it feels pretty definitive. Uh, mm-hmm. If only because um, you know, so my wife and I watched the film Portrait of a Lady on Fire recently. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. I hear it's great, but I haven't seen it. I'm going to be one of those turds who's like it's a masterful piece of film craft. Okay it's boring <laughs> gotcha. okay. and i yeah. had this feeling of like my wife doesn't watch many movies with me 
<laughs> and like halfway through, I'm like, why did I pick this one? <laughs> like this, this, <laughs> it's it's beautiful and it's a great story and you know right. it's sure. lovely and I get behind everything that it's about. It's just it's just kind of boring. But nah, I got gotcha. you. In the very smack in the middle of the movie, and this is another reason for it. Uh, so there's the two lead woman characters. One of them is talking to a third who's kind of a, a sub character, a secondary character. Okay. And she's telling the mythological story. What is the story where they turn around, the character turns around. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a myth. It's a myth. And, and okay. now, cause I didn't plan to talk about it. It's eluding me, but in the moment, the events, this character is recounting of this myth. I said, that's the movie. Like that's, that's where we're going. Oh, this, what's going to happen. Okay. Mm-hmm. The, the essence of the story she just told this other character is the story that's building here. Okay. And so for black Swan, if you recall, there's a part about midway through it's with, it's with the winter soldier. She's yes. telling him the story of, um, you know, the, uh, of the snow queen or whatever it's called. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so to me, I think the movie is meant to be metatextual, but that's mm. that's one reason. Now I'm with you. Like the movie plays very clearly with the psychology of her and mm-hmm. the the literal nature of what you are or are not seeing. Mm-hmm. But it's also that her telling that story and the meta commentary about the 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 that ballet to me is enough to feel like okay, I think they're kind yeah. of resting there so what that reminds me of and i and i'm going to apologize there's no way to to make my comment without spoiling a bit wow. of this oh, um, i thought you were about the, to make this comment without being a jerk or to make fun of you no 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 okay, um okay. so i know you haven't seen the wrestler i'm not going to spoil specifics uh, i'm going to say this as, as carefully as i can ravishing rick rude wins right <laughs> so at the end of the wrestler there's a there's a character beat where there is a question mark of, okay, if he does this, he is likely to die. And he makes the decision to press on, but we don't see whether or not he dies. And sure. so it leaves, you know, in the credits roll, and so it leaves this feeling of, okay, well, did, well, did he make it through it or did he die? And Aronofsky went on record for that film, and I'll loop it back to Black Swan in a second. He went on that film, he said, it doesn't matter whether he died or not, he made the decision to go forward. So he was basically deciding to die. So you can decide for yourself whether or not he actually did, but he is, his character is deciding to throw life to the wind and, and sort of move forward in the decision that he was about to make, even though we don't get to see what the ultimate outcome of that is. And in that same sense, in Black Swan, I think I could, I, I, don't, I, I don't even know that I'm fully convinced she doesn't die at the end. I just found it interesting that there was a, an alt theory to sure. to that to that um, take on it, but I do think whether it is a physical actual expiration or if it is merely a, a metaphorical sense, I do think her character has reached this place to where she will no longer be the same person. Like there, there is absolutely like a a, a death of sorts that takes place for her character in that end. Whether that is you know, means her character will not survive the night or whether that means it is metaphorical for her life beyond this. Maybe it is ultimately not the point. Uh, just that she has decided to die or she has made, she has given herself over to this and now she is not, she is no longer who she was before. I don't know. Um, we're thinking. talking about this movie. So, uh, yes. you know, I'm not trying to get real entrenched here, but as you're talking, I'm also thinking about the movie at its core is additionally about the toxic nature of obsession, like yes, toxic Mm -hmm. nature Mm -hmm. of not just obsession with uh, a tangible thing or, you know, like, Oh, I'm I'm obsessed with beanie babies or whatever, you know, like (laughs) that was a really random one, but um, (laughs) I don't know. We've been cleaning up while they're they're gone. So, you know, obsession and things are on my mind. Um, So whether it's obsession with a tangible item or like just a pursuit and ambition. And so I, I am with you. It's an interesting thought exercise. It feels a little counter to what Mm. the arc of the narrative is about um, to, to think that maybe she does kind of physically survive. But I I did wonder, I thought about trying to um, 
pose a, a version of this question to you, but so I'll, I'll pose it, at least the idea of it and kind of address it myself. And then you can decide if you want to kind of jump in on it because, you know, this, this movie invites reflection on obsession and pursuit. <clears throat> yeah. And the question I kind of want to pose, even though it's, it's sort of still uh, in this amorphous shape in my brain is, you know, are there areas of your life? Uh, are there things you can point to? Are there times in your history? Again, I recognize the potential for vulnerability there, but where you're like, okay, I got very obsessed with X or here and here's some fallout. And, and so, so interpret that and, and maybe ultimately follow it however, or if you want, but like by no means am I, where's her name? Where's her, um, Nina is her character. Nina, yeah. 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 Um, now is it Nina or <laughs> It's Nina Mila. <laughs> um, you know, by new by by new means. <laughs> by new means, am I like a nine? <laughs> Goodness gracious, <laughs> it's been a long conversational night. By new means, Um, not at all, like like Nina, but I, I mean, it. I am notoriously can be notoriously single-minded about mm. things mm. and you know again nowhere near i mean the film is is sort of metaphor and playing with heightened versions of things but you know it's it's ridiculous sometimes i i will lament to my wife sometimes i'm like i as a random innocuous example like if i have a thing going on on a particular day you know and the rest of the and and that thing is later in the day like an mm -hmm. event or a work appointment uh sometimes right. stuff like this um and the rest of the day doesn't have specific structure to it mm. it can be very difficult for me to 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 be productive in almost any other way uh, sure because sure. my brain is just focused on okay this thing is coming and and that's again it's very innocuous but that also plays out in broader ways too, where sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to, and will occasionally again, lament and or ask for help from my spouse. Like I need you to like redirect me somehow yeah, uh, because, because sure. I'm so just like, and I wish it were for actually like, oh, your drivenness led to all this like really lovely, productive, <laughs> right, whatever. Right, right, Usually right. it's just, Nathan, <laughs> you need to, you are, you are, you are. See, and this movie's all about mirrors, right? So I'm looking in the yes, mirror, sure. you know, okay. and yeah. it's like, mm -hmm. hey, buddy, <laughs> hey, buddy, come on, come on. You gotta stop. You, you gotta need stop. To, come on. You gotta, you gotta snap out of it. You need to yeah. do something different. Your kids need to eat, you know? They haven't eaten in five days. I'm just kidding. Right there, right there. No. <laughs> <laughs> kids haven't eaten in five days. You gotta stop. <laughs> They're knocking on the door. Say, so please, yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> Sure. So when I hear that question, what, what comes to mind is the ways in which the, the very first thing that comes to mind is the ways in which I can be a bit, and, and this is a metaphor that I think we've referenced on the show before. It's used in a variety of ways of, of the difference between being a, thermomus, a, a thermometer and a thermometer. A thermometer? A <laughs> The difference between a thermometer <laughs> and a nino, nino milo. Oh my gosh, we're, I don't know why we're stumbling so much over our words. Um, the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat in that uh, the thermometer, of course, takes on and displays the temperature of the room around it, whereas the thermostat regulates and controls the temperature of that room. And in the context of people, the analogy comes as that, like, do you take on the tone, flavor, language, attitude of the people in which in the group that you are a part of, or do you enter that group and change the tone of the room? And I definitely uh, have been more frequently in the camp of someone who will tend to, to a degree, take on the attitude. I don't feel like I'm like this as much now. I feel like in my mid to, to late 30s, I feel like I somehow shifted out of that. But unquestionably, in my 20s, there was a sort of an influential factor. I don't know that I would call it obsessive, but I do know that I struggled a lot to find out who I was in the midst of it because I, in certain contexts, could only sort of be like the people around me. 
I was still a version of myself, liking the things I liked, expressing the things I wanted to express. Um, but I think it took me a long time before I could really come into a sense of, well, this is who I am and what I'm about. And, um, you know, there's definitely like a people pleasing sort of fundamental aspect to me. And, and in that sense, and, and uh, let's just follow this conversation. Cause I, I, I think this is interesting. Like one of the things that this movie struck in me can maybe raise this up as a kind of a theme. I know we haven't talked a lot about specifics like likes, dislikes and scares and stuff like that, but uh, we can certainly get back to that if we need to. But one of the things that I found so interesting about this is when she's auditioning for the white swan and he's casting both and he keeps pressing her. And so much of the film is kind of about like, Hey, if you really want to, if you want to do this, if you want to be this role, then you're going to have to bring out your inner black swan. And where my mind went from that are certain key factors of like ambition or certain key factors of like success. Well, if you want to do this, if you want to accomplish X, then you're going to have to be cutthroat or you're going to have to accept that not everybody's going to make it. Or you're going to have to get rid of compassion. And I think about sometimes the way that some people talk about like leadership and, and they can talk about like, yeah, but if you want to be a real leader, then you can't be a friend. And if you want to be, you know, a real leader, then you're going to have to uh, sort of whip your team into shape and, and put them into place. Or there, or there could be certain goals or ambitions that they say, well, you can't fundamentally operate in this field unless you take on a bit of a darker sheen. And I sure. think about the ways in which leadership for many people means a display of power, or it means a display of, of controlling fear. And, uh, and that that's that if they want to reach a certain pinnacle or a certain status that they're going to have to, in the parlance of the movie, they're going to have to like be the black swan. You're going to have to, uh, to really let that, that darkness sort of emerge and find its way to the surface. Um, and that was, that was part of what I was scratching at in trying to unpack what I felt this movie was, was saying and talking about and thinking about in myself. I find my own personal journey has been very much about trying to recognize, I'm, I'm using this language deliberately, it's not meant to be uh, volcanic, trying to figure out who God made me to be and just do my best at being that. Hmm. And, and that means so much of, and the reason I said I don't mean that language to be volcanic is that sometimes people say that and they still make it, as we've talked about on the show before, they still make it very transactional. Like, oh, well, God made you to go do this. And God made you to go uh, do this for this person, or, or this is what you need to put your hands to or whatever. And I'm not really talking about that. I'm really, I'm talking about finding the place where you are uh, so at home in your own skin that you recognize like, no, this is, this is how God fashioned me. And that means recognizing where I'm not good at certain things and recognizing where I have a lot of growth to do and a lot more uh, sort of progress that needs to be made and recognizing also where I might bring some beneficial things to the table and I might contribute in a positive or substantive way to things and being able to really, you know, getting back to parasite language, like own the place, but own mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I think, you know, my, again, your question is, I think, an appropriate one although it, I'm taking it maybe to a place you didn't necessarily intend, but I really have gone in my thirties uh, in on a bit of a journey of finding out like, no, who, who am I and, right. and what am I about and what am I not about? And I think the struggle that Nina one struggle, because it's a complex film with a lot of potential applications and interpretations, but part of what she's struggling with is that, you know, in the initial stages, she's very childlike and she's very, she's got, Natalie Portman has uh, a kind of a cherubic voice as it were. Like she's got, uh, it's not just high pitched because it's actually not even that high pitched, but it's very sort of um, diminished as a vocal intonation. A very so, infantilized performance. Ah, yes. That's, that's the word. And, um, and so she is pressed in a lot of ways to, and in the film, it should be noted, if you have not seen this film, this film has some uh, sexually explicit uh, material in it, uh, both in some of the language and in a couple of actual scenes. 
But uh, what's interesting to me is it feels like everything around her is trying to push her out of that shell and break forth. But I found it so interesting in, in the context of the story and in the context of the performance she's trying to adopt that the director is trying to like pull out, essentially pull out uh, nastier things from her, like like edgier things from her, and uh, to kind of lose that sense of of uh, inhibition and restriction and everything. And I think for me, and the, maybe I'll shut up my ramblings. I think for me, coming to try to reach a place to where I'm comfortable in my own skin means no longer being pushed by certain people to be something I'm not coming more into a place of recognizing this is what I can contribute. So I'm going to try to, rather than strengthen my weaknesses, try to strengthen my strengths and try to just uh, be who I am and who I was made and designed to be and just be the best at doing that, not some, be the best uh, as in like competition. <clears throat> some very Thor in-game vibes you got going on there, Riri. Mm, um, okay. okay. Yeah, I do think that there's there's a thread in the film and i'm i'm kind of gonna explode it out a bit into a more practical like what you're talking about of uh one as an asterisk the film this time around in ways that i didn't sort of notice the first time has a lot of carrie white vibes going on mm -hmm. um mm. but you know you reference this and i wrote down this line the he picked me mommy oh that ain't, right that ain't right you know like, yeah Lucy. theoretically yeah. this yeah. this woman is at least at least late teens probably mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know right at, right at or around 20 early 20s um but i think it's also an interesting examination of like one arrested development for sure mm -hmm. but two you know you so single-mindedness uh, even, I even think in the thread of this conversation, obsessiveness is maybe the wrong word as much as um, like single-mindedness keeps coming to me and how our, our immature self, like I would say for me, what I just articulated about myself in terms of being single-minded and how I can get one track and, and like that is my, that is not the um, mature me. Like that is right, right. default patterns that kind of come up out of anxiety, um, not necessarily, but maybe fear, but, but more often just kind of anxiety because either I'm nervous about the thing that's coming or um, the world around me is causing me anxiety. And so I choose to narrow hone in on this one thing. And so sure, I right, right. mute all that other stuff. And, you know, for Nina, it's not just uh, her mom who has foisted upon her, you know, they're living in this tiny apartment. Um, the mom has her own unrealized sort of ambitions that she kind of burdens Nina with. Um, mm -hmm. And so that when someone does try to, try to finally push her out of that, it's, it is manipulative and it is yeah. coercive and it is toxic. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's only natural that it ends in expiration, right? Like that, that, you know, and, and, and I don't know how to overlay sort of faith language in here, but what just keeps coming to me is this notion of own the place and, and, as in that you just said of like what is the most mature version of self yes right you know it is, it is capacity to hold all of that stuff in tension mm -hmm. it is the capacity to say i do i am ambitious about x whatever it is mm -hmm. you know whether that's career whether that's hobby whatever uh but i also need and can and in maturity can grow to recognize that is not that's a fine thing ultimately mm -hmm. but not the thing and certainly not the thing i've sort of pushed myself and mold my being into um i mean you know and i, I reference on the show occasionally i mean i'm in a sales role and and have done that for 
over half a decade now, which is wild to consider. But, you know, I, I have learned, but, but mainly through sort of willful resistance to detach from that a good bit. Mm -hmm. But there are still times when you're like, okay, well, there have been moments in life uh, where I was very uh, ambitious, suggests a lot of energy was put into it, but at least mentally ambitious about things. Um, where I'm going with this is simply to say, it's hard to know and maturity means, I think, naming these areas that uh, might be good, might be bad, but are just things mm -hmm. that are external. Right. And saying, okay, I need, I can hold these things in tension. I can hold them loosely. Um, whether it's, you know, for me at many points in my life, the ambition to, oh, be a great actor and be, you know, kind of in that world and, and, um, you know, ho however you want to articulate that, um, and wrestling through, okay, what does it look like to just, as you're describing, live in your place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, instead of a fractured mirror, looking back at you, it's, I know dead horse here, God disguised as your life and, right, right. and, yeah. and, and recognizing that and it isn't distorted and it isn't, you know, kind of the skewed perverted vision. It's just clarity. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's a hard place to, to stay in, but, yeah. you know, as we see with Nina, which again is heightened and metaphoric, but you know, to, to not attempt to learn how to stay there will mm -hmm. be ruinous. Well, and I think can be ruinous. Now my, now my brain's, now my brain's starting to go. Um, so I think there's something, I think there's something significant about the, the, what, what's coming to mind as we're talking about this uh, single mindedness and sense of self. I, I think about that scene where, you know, when on a, we're there, <laughs> um, where Winona Ryder uh, is, who's in this film for like five minutes, and you know she's she's barely in it, but some of her scenes are really crucial because she's the former starlet, who's now been uh, you know replaced and to a degree excised, to be replaced by Natalie Portman's character, and so when Natalie Portman visits her in the hospital after she has presumably stepped in front of a car on purpose uh, to, to, to possibly in an attempt to end her life in total. And in one of the more, because there's the last half hour of this is. It's rough. Oh, oh, it is horrific. And in one of the most brutally violent scenes, I mean, there's a lot of graphic things that happen, but it's really sort of like body horror. It's people happening. It's things happening to people. There's not a lot of person on person violence, but there's one scene in the hospital where when owner writer takes that, that nail, nail file, file yeah. yeah. And begins to, uh, this happens in the film. Uh, she begins to stab herself in the face and I forget the exact thing that she's saying while she's doing this, but she's basically saying like, I have nothing or I am nothing, you know, like she's, she's stabbing herself because she has lost and hear hear my language here. She's mm -hmm. lost the role. So she's lost the, in the, and you and I are both, uh, you know, in our day got theater degrees and, and are performers and, and we understand to a degree that performer mindset. And so without the role, she has no sense of singular identity. Without the role that was awarded to her and that she is being pushed to embody perfectly she has no sense of self that's the one on a writer character but nina's going through a very comparable sort of journey right. is that without that role and it, it should be noted in the film that you know i think i read somewhere that aronofsky feels like the real antagonist of this film is the director is is he's uh -huh. the one uh yes uh leroy is his name is what his name? No, no, what's shut up. no, what's his name? What's the director's name? I'm blanking on it. Toma. Oh, yeah. Toma Leroy. I'm not insane. His last name is Leroy. 
the reason I, the reason I, well, you just got to listen when I'm like, Toma, this French name. And you're like, what about Leroy? I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't think that's right. And we've been really, playing with names the whole conversation. I'm like, you I are know, pulling my I, leg here. No, I you're stabbing my face with a nail file. The reason that it is, <laughs> it's so painful. Um, the reason that it stood out to me for a second is because when he gives her the flowers, I think the person says they're from Leroy, not, uh, not Leroy. Um, I'm from the South. Okay. We say I mean, this man's not Thomas, Thomas Leroy. See, I'm telling you, that's why Hydra's after him. It's a cover. It's true. It is. It's a, it's a faux identity, but, um, Aronofsky to get back to my point, Aronofsky had said that he views, uh, Thomas as the, as the ultimate antagonist of the film because, and in the context of the conversation we're having, he is the one who like destines fate for these people. What happens when his little princess, Winona Ryder, is out and she is retiring? Well, then she, she loses her sense of grip on reality. She doesn't know who she is anymore. So she sees no further alternative but to step in front of a moving vehicle and, and try to end things for herself. Even still, as Nina embraces this, she becomes desperately jealous that Lily is going to come in and assume her role and that Lily's trying to undermine her success in this performance. And everything that she's pushing herself to is to assume a role. And I think that's, to me, uh, a, a more articulated version of what I'm scratching at is that there are so many voices and so many pressures that try to push you into assuming a role mm -hmm. and in in assuming a role that that demands of you i'm going to use an example that could be a little politically charged i'm not fully intending to in this moment but the conversation around political correctness and the, the that when someone expresses a general sensitivity to certain language or certain um, images or, or, or something. And I will admit right out the gate that sometimes their sensitivity to that language could express itself in immature ways, that sometimes they are insensitive themselves in trying to express sensitivity. But what you then get is you get this thing that begins to rise up and say like, well, I'm, I'm not politically correct. I just, you know, I just sort of say it bluntly like it is. And what I've seen that to be in the fight over what is and is not quote unquote politically correct is a steady eroding of polite civility in general, like just a steady eroding of sensitivity in dialogue. So that what, what happens is you get people who assume something as a matter of pride and say, hey, if you, if you want to confront this problem, you're going to have to stop being Mr. Nice Guy. If you want to confront this problem, I just tell it like it is. I'm going to, I'm not going to play this game of civility and I'm not going to, I don't care if you're offended or not. And they, they begin to sort of assume this role that they feel they are somehow destined or, or being pushed to play that, um, that they think is going to, well, this is who I am. And they think this is, this is how I'm supposed to be. But that's all it is. It's just, it's just a role. It's just a facade to, to maybe get a little bit more specific about what I'm talking about. Like I'm, I'm seeing friends and family members in different contexts begin to sort of adopt pieces of language that are along certain themes and subjects. And I apologize for the vagueness here. I just don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But I see them adopt language. And when I hear it, my first thought in reaction to their social media post or in reaction to their comment or in reaction to their text message, my then immediate thought is that's not you. Like that's not your heart. That's not, right. that's not who you are. That is, I mean, that is completely in contrast with who I know you to be and what I know you to fundamentally desire to pursue in your life and to cultivate in your life. So what, is, and this is what I want to ask that Black Swan is sort of rising up in me. So what I want to ask of these people who I love and care about is what role are you adopting? What is pushing you into this role, into this persona that makes you feel like you have to, you know, um, contribute in this way or that you have to adopt? Like I feel many times very peculiar in the sense that, and I'm not saying I'm some unique 
you know, uh, animal in God's creation or whatever. But I do frequently feel peculiar in that I genuinely cherish challenging conversation that will sometimes include disagreement with me. And I genuinely cherish when somebody can have an honest and human conversation in which they do not necessarily hold my opinions because I feel this is only to my benefit. Either I will understand better why I hold the positions I do or those positions will be challenged and I will move into a uh, more substantive one by having gained new information or by having gained new insight. And to me, that looks like me becoming my best self and me becoming who I'm, I'm made to be. Um, and I feel like to simply adopt language or to simply adopt attitudes that other people are pushing you to is merely to assume a role that's not really who you are. And I feel like obviously in the context of Black Swan, it's, it's about a performance and it's about a, um, you know, she's literally in front of an audience and she's literally on opening night. And, um, and there's those ambitions and obsessions that could be talked about, but it's pivoting things in me that have deeper and, and wider ramifications because I see people adopting a lot of roles and personas that then when you get them, and, and I guess I don't know, and this is a scary, scary statement I'm about to make. I guess I don't know if the role and the persona were the niceties I saw before or if it's this. And oh, that's, the, that's the hard part to stomach. Yeah, I think that's a fair concern. Uh, the way you are articulating this reminds me of the Andrew Morant's antisocial quote, to change how we talk is to change who we are. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to pivot uh, uh, sort of deep here real quick, uh, and then we can kind of figure out where we want to go next. But like, there's a reason um, scripture refers to Jesus as a word, the word. And I think part of that is just uh, our, our, not just the words we use, I don't mean the vocabulary, but the nature of our speech, mm. the flavor of it, the compassion or empathy of it or not is very indicative of an essence, right? Of mm. as Roar talks, a true self or a false self. Now, <clears throat> um, this will come up uh, in, in the weird time travel way we do these podcasts. This gets alluded to on next week's episode. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I began reading just because uh, I guess I'm a bandwagon jumper. I don't know, but I began reading How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. And um, he talks in there, and I'm only 30 pages in, um, but he talks in there how we are all participants, right? Like, like the, the, the sort of uh, system Kendi lays out, which I imagine, though I'm not far enough in the book, that he, he cites people before himself who do this, but, you know, he is specifically writing about the notion of anti-racism. Yeah. Like, basically the idea that um, you are either anti-racist or you are participating in and propagating and perpetuating okay. racial yeah structures, hierarchies behaviors and because you know to your point um you might have real profound versions of that yeah you might have just sort of small tiny versions of that mm -hmm. and where i'm going with this is simply the same idea is true in terms of the shades of racism with our our verbals being indicative of our essence, you know, mm, like, like, mm. is it persona? Is it you? Well, if how we talk, um, you know, uh, changes who we are, then ultimately 
aren't those things pretty closely tethered to each other? Right. And it's only when, because here's the sad part is you have to pursue that true self. You have to, mm. you have to be anti-racist in that paradigm, but mm. like you have to, you have to go after that or you're just going to be this. Mm. And, and by mm. that and this, I mean, you have to go after the true self mm. or you're just going to keep being the faults in varying ways. Right. And right, in right. lesser and greater levels of toxicity, but, and, and, you know, it, it, all analogies are a little broken, but, you know, are we ever on this side of an eternal version of things going to fully enmesh or I'm sorry, fully embody our, truest self no i mean that's kind of right absurd thing. right but you know if and i think it is life is meant as a gift to continually uh uh infinite knowability as rora mm-hmm. puts it um you know the 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 gift of my life and of yours for yourself is the continual churning and tilling and pursuing and uncovering and discovering of the of that true self yeah and that in and that in that work all of these you know in in the film's language it's mom's expectations it's Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. the visual uh manifestations in the pink room the infantilized sort of uh manner of of speaking and of sure right right and of movement like all of these things are foisted upon elsewhere like yes that is mm. that is, and and for me at least in this current uh interpretation for me of the film i don't think she ever finds her true self like i mm. i, I yes. think mm. i think she falls off the end into yeah. the most destructive and, and catastrophic version of fault self. Because and she embodies the role perfectly. That's sure, what the final yeah. lines of the film, and, it was perfect. And yes. it's not, it's not, it shouldn't be lost on us that it is a broken mirror that kills her. Like, yeah. oh, absolutely. Literally, you know, mm-hmm. it takes her life. And, and so I think, you know, um, it's funny. At some point, people are going to be like, oh, my God, Nathan, get some different mentors. Sure, I hear you. But <laughs> Roar talks about great love or great suffering are mm-hmm. these things that push us further towards that true self. Yeah. Um, you know, and and um, I don't know. I don't know. I think single-mindedness um, has a place. Sure. Yeah. And and can be valuable, you know, if you're if you're stuck in a life or death situation and 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 I don't even mean that jokingly. I just mean like literally, like if you're in a scenario where harm is gonna befall you in a real physical, maybe catastrophic sense, single mindedness is great. You need yeah. some right. some narrowing right. of focus. Sure. But yeah. You're never meant to live there. You're never meant to, for that to be the fullest version of you. And and to get back to what you're describing and to to reincorporate what I was saying about the notion of the word i think i'll say this for myself i'm not declaring this but i have wondered lately um have i begun have i begun to settle for a less imaginative lived experience than i think is out there and that's mm. a really weird way to put that. The germs of that, so so the bridge is a little clearer than the rickety thing I just laid out there. As I've grown more informed, which I actually do think is a good thing to be informed. I think we're over-informed and, and thus we're misinformed and blah, blah, blah. But there are times when I'm like, there's there's a better... I'm I'm letting the way other people are talking change who I am. Yes. Yes. And yes. and those people may be literal headlines that I'm reading. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Day in and day out. Mm-hmm. Those people may be colleagues whom I don't really sync with, you know, like mm-hmm. like this bombardment that you don't recognize is happening. Yeah, of course. Until ultimately you're like, wait a minute. 
I actually do think life is a lot more good and beautiful and wondrous than I've started to act like it is. Yeah. Mm. And that my mm -hmm. place in it is to be a, an emissary of that good, beautiful wonder and not just, I do think there's a place for it, not just a constant critic. Right. Um, and I think there's something cause the, the director in this piece, Leroy, what, Leroy, or <laughs> his, his, his reaction to Beth is her name, his reaction to Winona Ryder, her character's name is Beth, uh, to the accident is like sort of a, sh like he takes no culpability. Oh yeah. In, in what was clearly at least, at least partially, if not majority, uh, uh, majorly uh, driven by his actions to push her to that state. And it also got me thinking about the ways in which like, you know, they, they absolve genius by like, oh, he's a genius. Well, yeah, but he's also a sadist and he's a right. jerk right. and he's then he's a sick man. And, and, and to your point, we don't know precisely how young Natalie Portman's character is supposed to be, but young and the way he's treating her and the way he's kind of, kind of pushing her um, is, uh, is it, it's really very difficult to absolve whatever sort of brilliant genius performance he's trying to extract from people. And to your point about the way certain voices are causing you, to, like, I don't want to reach a point to where I can't recognize myself sitting in, in a room full of people or, and that room may be scrolling through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Like, I don't want to recognize, I don't want to get to a place to where I can't recognize myself and my own reactions to what's going on in the world around me. I want to be, I want to be so aware of the things that I hold dear, the things that I cherish. I was having a conversation earlier this evening with, uh, with my father-in-law about, about the importance of a thing like, and this is, this film is about like, but like, not about this, but has a lot of body horror to it and like body transformations and things like that. And, and I was speaking and, and again, this is edging up to a political conversation. I'll make it very briefly, but I was speaking in a very frustrated manner about how I've seen some recent like um, mockery being made of like president Trump trying to take a drink of water or try to walk down a ramp or, or, or something like that. And I remember my immediate reaction when I saw that some people were kind of, you know, on the internet teasing him about this. And I should be really blunt before I make this statement. I am not, if you've been listening to our show at all, I am not a fan of our current president and, uh, you know, feel how you want to about me and, and my feelings on that there. But I've been uh, very vocal against him since early in his campaign. But when I see mockery being made of like those physical affectations. What it raises up in me is it raises up in me the notion that I have that bodies and the people that inhabit them are sacred. And so when I see mockery being made of affectations that are purely physical, not what he's saying, not what his ideology is, but something that's purely physical, then something raises up in me of like, wait a minute, now, wait a minute. <laughs> Like, we can't be a bully in that sense just because we don't like the man or because we don't like what he represents or what he stands for or whatever. We, ca we can't be a bully in those other ways. And I feel like that's the insidious nature of some of these vo voices and influences is that they'll get us to lose our sense of self and our sense of, of a consistent ethic where, we'd, where we would apply it here or where we would apply it there, then suddenly when it's the group we're opposed to, or when it's counterproductive to the role that we're supposed to adopt, then we have to violate our own personal ethics, and we have to violate our own personal code of, of the way we conduct ourselves to other people. And, and I feel like the real challenge, the real difficulty is to, to always resist assuming or adopting a role and everything that that role is supposed to inhabit. In all of the different conversations that are being had right now, I feel like the way polarization works 
is you're either with us or you're against us. You're either on this side or you're, or you're not on our side. And I feel like that can be, can be okay in certain contexts for like a, a deciding portion, like you're either helping or you're hurting. But I think that sometimes there's this feeling that like, well, if you're on that side, then you can't challenge certain pieces of it or you can't question certain pieces right. of it. And, and that's where I think it gets really difficult in the context of Black Swan. He's like, you've got you've to get to this place where if you, he says, if it's just the white swan, the role would be yours. But I'm casting the black swan too. And so he, he pushes her into a kind of, it's not only his fault, but a kind of psychotic break where she begins like seeing sure. herself as her own op opponents. And she begins this real disconnected sense of self to the degree that the film, you talked about the broken mirror, to the degree that the film leaves it ambiguous, uh, maybe not too ambiguous, that like essentially she stabbed herself in this struggle against herself. That's what we're left with, right? That like the mirror broke and she essentially like plunged that shard of mirror into herself supposedly telling herself because in the vision in the scene in the movie she's viewing Mila Kunis's Lily. character she's viewing Lily and she's choking her and she's saying it's my turn it's my right. turn this is mine but she we find out later that she was really having that war with herself and think about this this came to me while you were talking a minute ago um because the sad part as the movie illustrates with a with a tool meant to reflect ourselves with a tool meant to see ourselves mm. that more often than not when we think we are attacking a supposed enemy we are really only damaging ourselves oh my god that's great yes yes i mean Absolutely. and that sucks yeah. it sucks yeah. i want the in in my worst moments i you know i want that cathartic F them all, you know, kind of mentality. And yet it is that sort of, it is indulging that. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, we, we, you and I do a show about horror movies. It is itself a catharsis. And so that's a positive, but like indulging those sort of fantasies, indulging those sorts of mental trains of thought too deeply and too far in a, in a natural way is the quickest it, it is the it is the definition of how we speak changes who we are it is yeah, right it is you altering the true self that is the gift of your own life yeah oh my god nathan like i'm just like i've been floored by the the observation of that like like um a, a tool meant to show us ourselves mm -hmm. and then we in the delusion feeling like we are attacking the opposition are really only hurting ourselves. I mean, I'm bowled over by that. Like that's, I feel like that's something that is a diagnosis of our current state of, of conversation. Like yeah. this is meant, this is an, a, a, a prime opportunity to see ourselves, to really see ourselves and, and to therefore take stock of, of, what we look like and what we are and how mm -hmm. we may want that to change. But instead we shatter the damn thing and stab it into what we view as the other side right. and only realize too late, we've plunged it into our own middle. I mean, like that, I recognize that that may not have been on Aronofsky's mind when he, when he crafted black That's Swan. pretty strong symbolism. It's, it's there. It's absolutely there. And, and I feel like that, is so if we are not careful and if we are not conscious then that is where we will find ourselves in the effort to adopt the role we believe is our destiny in an effort to adopt the persona we believe is ultimately what we're supposed to pursue we will shatter the opportunities to really see ourselves and mm -hmm. ultimately end our own lives in the effort to end the lives of our opposition i mean it's it's I funny. It's I, staggering. I, I was talking to my wife recently about our kids and how to, they've, they've, it causes me 
mild anxiety, but they've, but it's pretty tame. They've started using Facebook messenger, like just the messenger. Yeah. Messenger you know? kids. Yeah. yeah my yeah, son yeah. too. Right. Right. And it's, you know, I have to think back. Okay. When I was in, you know, middle school ish and the, and I mean, we called our friends. So like, that's not that weird a thing, but yeah, it, the problem is, is, is those steps past this, but I'm, I'm coming to um, uh, Toma and the mom, like, uh, mm. of the film and and looking at this thing in the real world because I was talking to my wife I was like I'm trying to find the words to to if I'm talking to my children about why this stuff can be so hazardous and it's about naming influences yeah right in other in other words let's take just social media I ignore you know, just the messenger thing, but social media period. It's like, you're not just under an influence of the psychology inherent to what a newsfeed does to you, which is documented and vastly. So you're not just under the influence of uh, your peers or not thoughts delude, uh, bombarding you. Uh, you're also under the influence of um, behind the scenes actors who are who are executing things. Right, right. You're also right. under the influence of the attention economy, which is a real pernicious thing. So, and all I'm trying to say is that's just one cultural item. Yeah. Social media. Right. These are all the influences right. you are at the mercy of. Right. And don't, right. Right. And as someone who still tries to understand it all, like mm -hmm. much less mm -hmm. a 10 year old an eight year old, whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's that, um, you know, at your friend's house, the, there are influences that are acting upon you. That yeah, might right, be, of course. um, you know, let's say your friend's parents are think differently than mom and daddy. Like, well, those influences will start to, to kind of hem in and, and sort of create thought patterns and whatnot, whatever. So just naming these influences and, and how when you ultimately strip that all away and and in that conversation with my wife it was like things like nature like this is why getting into nature or getting alone in in a whether it's meditation or or if you do right. yoga that's your thing and in, in a different lifetime like your quiet time that sort of idea is the intention is yeah. dulling and 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 exterminating and and evacuating all these influences from your brain and heart and spirit right. to be able to have the benevolent influencer mm -hmm. act upon you, mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. nature. So where I'm going with this is in the, in your sort of thread of the role, it's, it's also just these forces that are pushing you, you know, like, yeah. like you, uh, I'm not saying um, you should, but like you haven't said much about the mom, but I think she's a key role, a key influencer Mm. and how nina sees herself yeah i, I agree uh, then you've got the um uh toma acting upon her too and like she she doesn't know what she looks like yeah. Mm. yeah yeah and that's what happens when you're under the spell of so many definitely destructive but even just so many influences period we don't know what we look like we don't yeah. know the sound of our voice right right Right. I mean, this is Absolutely. sort of what you were talking about a minute ago of, of learning yourself and recognizing that at least catching glimpses of that true self. Yeah. Exercising that voice. Yeah. Recognizing that, you know, if, if it's, you know, I was going to say something poetic, like if it's, if it's the voice of love, it's the voice of God. Like that's, yeah. that is what echoes. Well, forth because, because if we don't know our own voice, how can we hope? to recognize that still small voice of his. But how, see, it's so we? funny because I feel like what you're saying there, and, and this isn't me saying, oh, I'll pat myself on the back, but like, I keep coming back to a ghost story. Like we, I speak for me, and I think you would probably yeah. echo this, but so much of the Christian input, culturally speaking, for, you know, I, I you, you were weaned on it, I plugged into it in my middle school years and, but dove hard. Mm -hmm. So much of it was external and exterior. 
Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and God in his great goodness extended to you, the wretch, Mm. there's songs about it, but yeah, of course, but, but I'm, I'm not there anymore. I'm in the, no, God gifted me with me. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and to know that, yeah, and to know myself as myself, to, mm-hmm. to, that, 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 you know, to, to look at that unbroken mirror. Right, right. And find in it, capital G, good, mm. is itself God disguised as me. Yeah. Know that's super metaphysical. No, no, no. Bigger. And, and, uh, yeah, and we're... We're not in completely dissimilar places, although I do still operate from a paradigm of a very, an internal reality and an external reality that are of the same cloth. That, um, that in in the same way that there is, you know, likeness and begottenness, that there is an external and that there is an internal, and that they are of the same uh, uh, nature, but that there is a a fracture that has to be sort of um, reconciled in order to really uh, move forward in wholeness with that external and internal uh, situation. So that's, yes, that you know, <laughs> to, to, to uh, see your metaphor and, uh, or see your metaphysical and raise you metaphysical. Uh, right. But, but I think rather than, cause as we're, as we're getting to the, the, you know, a potential sort of winding down place for this conversation, I do think there's, there's crucial, crucial consideration to be made of you said multiple times i agree with it i know it's richard Rohr first god comes disguised as your life and i think a lot of the hard work is about in recognizing uh what isn't what is the influence that's not who who god has has right. fashioned and formed you to be and and to lose that that sense of shade that distracts and distorts from who you were designed and, and, and meant to be. And I do think, uh, yes, I mean, I still operate very much under the sense of, you know, that, that God is speaking and that in the, in the ways he is speaking, there are no boundaries through which he might communicate my own heart and mind, uh, the, the, the scriptures, the, um, nature of experience and 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 I know that that's some people would hear that and you'd be like and, they, and they'll have a conniption fit. You that's know, our but, show. Yeah, <laughs> but but what that makes I'm sorry to cut you off, but this feels important and and adding to a layer to it. I always think um, of in Cormac McCarthy's The Road and uh, the father says of the child um, effectively if his is not the voice of God, then God never spoke. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think of that in just loving human relationship, right? Right. It's like, if the truest read, if the, if the true self of read isn't issuing forth the voice of God, then God does not speak. Mm, Like, mm, like mm. I know that's a little wonky and weird, but that's what's coming to me in this moment, this notion of, of, of trueness of self and articulating from that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't cut you off. No, 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 that's no. And, and I do think I would adopt that and I would say, abandon the role, abandon the, the artifice, the artifice, the, the Swan Lake casting decision and, and pursue, pursue the true self and, and follow after that. And um, yeah, I would, I would wholeheartedly agree. A, wow. I never, I didn't quite expect, I knew it would be an either. interesting conversation, but I didn't quite expect this one. Um, but listen, I know we don't have to do a, 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 a litany of scares, but one <laughs> that feels like it is summary for all the rest, Riri, that girl got web toes. That ain't right. That, that ain't right. That, that is ain't not right. right. Well, every bit, I mean, like, 
Good Lord. All of the like skin picking and uh, 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 no, nail clipping and everything and skin picking and, and all this stuff. Like, and the skin off the red in the, in, I, in no, the no, no. Like they got me like squirming Ooh. when they're just tying their hair up in a bun. Like I just I couldn't <laughs> like that ain't right. Like they, you got me squirming just because you you're going to put your hair up. Go wash your hands. With that sound. I just I couldn't. I couldn't with the whole thing. The whole thing ain't right. Um, so you you want to pivot sure. into the fog meter. So Man, the fog meters are exhausting. very. <laughs> is our very specific metric of fear and God where we rate these films uh, on their scares and their substance. I'll go first on fear. I think particularly in the last half hour, it has some really uh, sort of volcanic frights to it, um, both visual and sense of like uh, uh, thematically and just metaphorically. So I'm going to lean high here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this uh, fear factor like a nine. I mean, like it's it's pretty harrowing towards the end. Pretty chilling. It is, and I think uh, I think I'm gonna join you at that nine. I was gonna him towards an eight, but you know, <laughs> friendship. But I but um, I influenced you. <laughs> you did, you did. But you're a good influencer, um, a good influence. Um, who mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Um, I think part of what ratchets everything up a notch is just her performance by the end it's not just the stuff oh, yeah, that's happening yeah. it is how in it yeah portman is in that fully committed yeah, fully committed wicked. um yeah uh, deserving of the many awards uh what would you say for the god meter um i'm gonna give it a seven because i think that it's riddled with thoughts and mm. uh allegory not allegory but you know metaphor and and these things these symbolism is is what i'm looking for there um but aronofsky's hard i mean i I worry about the guy um and so i don't know exactly it would be interesting i didn't go i didn't do the work to go listen to interviews or, or read interviews for interpretation but just knowing his typical kind of output um yeah yeah, i'm just gonna stop talking give it a seven sure yeah 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 uh i'm gonna you join me with my nine on on fear i'm gonna join you with your seven on god um i feel like aronofsky asks powerful and important questions i don't often know if even he knows how he feels about them or what he thinks about them um, and I may be incorrect about that, but I feel like in a lot of his films, they are evocative in powerful ways, but um, not always very conclusive to the degree where you have much to to hold on to after the fact. But they are uh, about very interesting things, and and uh, Black Swan is is no different. I didn't really try to make the case, but were we to still have the conversation into the technical mechanics of it, I think there's a case to be made that craft wise. Black Swan is his strongest film and, and perhaps his greatest staggering. achievement. Yeah, it's, it's really tight as a film, uh, paced to perfection, uh, heavy as can be, but, uh, but there's, there's a lot to it. Um, and so, yeah, so seven. And that means that we give uh, Black Swan, directed by Darren Aronofsky and starring the multi-award winning Natalie Portman, an eight out of ten on the fog meter. Um, right. But the more prescient question... Would you recommend Black Swan? Um, uh, yeah, I think I think um, you know it, it's mature, uh, but not I don't think in a in an off putting way. Uh, if it's not whatever, yes, I recommend it. Um, I love the word you used. It's a mature film, so yeah. I think for mature mindsets, it's an easy recommendation. Yeah, um, I I do think that it is not oppressive to the degree that I would overly caution people, unless you're particularly no. sensitive to, uh, yeah, you know, same. like, yeah, <laughs> well, in certain uh, <laughs> sexually explicit uh, moments, which are not pervasive through the film, but do exist, unless you're particularly sensitive to that. My mama fell like, asleep in that room. That ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't right. That ain't right. Um, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> covers over the head. Um, so no, so I would join you in your recommendation. It, it is a film I recommend. Um, it's 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 a mature maybe not for experience. Christmas. Maybe not. Merry Christmas. Um, <laughs> but I do think that that your your statement there is is uh, most appropriate. It is a mature viewing experience, and in that sense, I would recommend it. So uh, cool. So yeah, 
Yeah. Great. That was, that was another edition. Yeah. That was another edition of 2020, 2020, putting 2010 in the books. It'll be a little bit of time before we get back to 2011 and beyond because next week we are officially inaugurating. <laughs> so uh, we will be having a lengthy and very fun conversation with author Matt Ruff about his novel, Lovecraft Country. Really nice guy. We have a really fun conversation that we think you're going to enjoy a lot. Tread into um, some deeper waters here and there, but a lot of great in insight and information into his book and what it's about and how he crafted it. Um, it's, a, it's just a really fun conversation, uh, and we think you're really going to enjoy it. So that is taking place next week. And then the week following that, we will be diving back into Leftovers Season 2 for that next phase. So this has been a fun abbreviated intermission of 2020 yeah. 2020 um thank you as always nathan for having these conversations with me i really appreciate of course. it um uh, and that, for, one was, for, that was a fun one i liked yeah. how that went I, yeah me, I too. Didn't me too do any of my notes except the web toes <laughs> i get it i get it um so listeners uh, as we say on every episode the fear of god is the beginning of wisdom but not the end of the conversation and in that spirit we encourage you to fear nothing else and be on your way rejoicing we will see you next week, everybody. See you next week, guys. Bye. Yeah, I did not expect that out of Black Swan, um, but...